Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Atheist Experience. <laughs> hey, uh, today is Sunday, December, so January, <laughs> January 7th, 2018. I got that number right. Yay. Uh, happy, and happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm Russell Glasser, and with me today is my co-host, John I. Coletti. Howdy. Hi. And uh, so I'm going to level with you, audience. Uh, this is going to be one of those shows. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we always say that uh, when we do live TV, sometimes uh, we have to go with sort of a warts and all approach, and we expect this show to have a lot of warts, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the Internet in this building is messed up. <laughs> um, Apparently, it's working enough to broadcast live to an audience, and somebody can confirm to me whether uh, the YouTube is uh, is actually working and streaming. But for some reason, um, my connection is popping up and up and down, and usually not connected to the internet. And you wouldn't think that's a problem because hey, I shouldn't be just surfing the web at the same time as I'm uh, trying to host a show. But the thing is, uh, the internet drives a lot of our call screening software, and that means what we can't do is the usual thing, which is take the live calls that drive the show. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing we can't really do. Uh, quickly, discreetly Google News while we are trying to talk. Uh, I got a phone. Uh, modern technology is wonderful. Um, and we're actually streaming the show through somebody's cell phone Yeah, that's what we're doing. So. <laughs> yeah, so we're using a mobile phone hotspot, uh, and I hope you have unlimited data and don't pay for it. Yes, good, good decision. <laughs> um, so thank you, Eric. Yep. So uh, long story short, thank, uh, yes, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, who is also involved with Talk Heathen, uh, the, the new show that you can watch. We're going to be doing a lot of time fillers today. Uh, now, you're not just going to have to listen to me and John uh, do our stream of consciousness thing. We got some things prepared for you. First and most important, if you are watching the show live, and that means if you are here right now, January 7th, 2018, between the hours of 4.30 and 6 o'clock, and no other time. Central, central U.S. time. Central U.S. <laughs> right now, if you're seeing a live stream of this show, what you can do to help me is uh, uh, post news links or questions to Twitter. If you have a Twitter account, use hashtag AXP Topics. That's Atheist Experience Topics, AXP Topics. Uh, if you have a link, I, I may pull it up on my phone. If you have a short question that can be uh, expressed in a tweet or two, we might spend some time discussing your question. Uh, we will mention your uh, Twitter name unless you tell us not to. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, some random news stories that we could talk about. I have done a couple of talks in the past that I could break out, and we have a lovely audience who can uh, get on the microphone and ask some questions to us live. Uh, and John, what am I forgetting? <laughs> I think that's it. We're, we, we're still getting together for dinner after the show at Star of India. Of course, yes. Just I didn't read any of the other stuff. Rolling right. on the screen there. So uh, if nothing <coughs> else, please join us for dinner. Uh, yeah. We'll get there about 6.30 or so. Right. Uh, the Atheist Community of Austin is uh, the, spot, the uh, <laughs> producer of the Atheist Experience. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, with a newer, more interesting mission statement coming to you soon after a whole bunch of committee meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, John, what's been happening to you lately? Well, I had a nice holiday. We, we were sick for several days during that holiday and uh, from what I understand Texas is number one right now in cases of the flu mm -hmm. so uh, pretty much everybody you know is sick at you know has been sick at one time or another for the last several weeks are you okay I mean I'm fine yeah re recovered now but that right. kind of put a damper on the and it's mm -hmm. been really cold in Austin and you know people up north are saying 
<laughs> yeah, am amateurs because you know to us really cold is like in the twenties. I mean, we we were ecstatic because we got maybe a centimeter of snow this Christmas, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it never happens if we get yeah, any snow at all. Every we ten, don't get 10 snow years, often. Yeah, it's you know it's usually January, February, so. Yeah, so I got a Vive for Christmas, and I've been playing a lot of virtual reality stuff, uh, which I've posted about a bit on my Facebook page. Uh, I've been uh, I've been sitting myself down in a chair and trying to escape imaginary death traps in virtual space. Uh, playing uh, a few of the games I've played recently are I Expect You to Die and Dual Wielding Rocket Launchers in Serious Sam. Okay. <laughs> Those are uh, those are some good games. Uh, let's see. So um, I'm sorry. So uh, and I didn't bring a topic today of all of all <laughs> shows to not bring a topic to you know talk about for the first few minutes of the show. But we'll <laughs> we'll muddle on and uh, maybe you want to go to audience questions first while we yeah, wait for the Yeah, do we have any audience in? questions? Uh, Forgive me in advance for all these awkward pauses that we are definitely going to have. I am also trying to pick uh, to pull up the latest version of the talk of the last talk I gave, which was uh, September, uh, and the title of the talk is oh, not that one. <laughs> uh, fake news, skepticism, and fake news. Uh, it, all right. What's up from the audience? I have a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Uh, the question is, it is now 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been 20 years that the ACA has been rolling on. This what? is Eric, right? No, this is, a, this is an audience member. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I can't see you. There are lights directly in my face. It, what, it, what, it, is, what does the ACA have planned uh, moving forward into 2018? Do you have anything up your sleeve or anything you're willing to announce? Or is, uh, hmm. is, is this what we're looking at? Do we have any big changes coming up in the future? That would be a good question for the president of the ACA oh, yeah. to answer. Uh, especially on a day when we just had a board meeting. Which, uh, which tend to be very boring, so they live up to their name. Uh, but uh, let, let me think what's going on with the ACA lately. First of all, um, <clears throat> uh, last year we started uh, actively looking for, uh, for donations, which has uh, greatly helped the ACA's budget, uh, and although uh, we apparently still have problems with our internet, and uh, if you think, uh, and it would certainly be the case that we could always use more money to help improve our show infrastructure. Just before the show, we were talking about uh, backup systems that we could have in case, because we apparently need backup systems for every single feature that makes the show come at you live. Um, so in case you are feeling so inclined, uh, on this side of me, I think, <laughs> there's a donate button uh, in the, on the YouTube channel. Uh, and if you click that and would like to give us a donation, then it will probably, in the big picture, reduce the likelihood of any of this happening again. Uh, now, uh, we have been discussing a lot of things uh, that we would like to do. First of all, we are already uh, st starting up the conversations about who we would like the guest to be for our 2018 uh, ACA Bat Cruise. Uh, and we got some pretty cool names going, and uh, we still have some more brain se brainstorming sessions to do. Um, we are planning to uh, make further improvements on our website. Uh, we also have plans to uh, better consolidate and unify our social media presence, including uh, winding up uh, more activity on our Twitter and our Facebook pages. Uh, we, we might uh, wind up uh, hopefully getting more people involved and not necessarily just volunteers. Um, we want to do a lot of stuff that may include uh, uh, that that may include getting a bigger building for in the next few years. Uh, none of this is a promise, 
but uh, these are all stuff, these are all things that we are discussing. Um, and in terms of local community outreach, yeah. we're, we're starting up a secular parenting group, That's which right. is really exciting. We, uh, we've needed that for a long time, so I want to thank uh, Eric for getting that rolling as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what else did I want to mention? Oh, if you didn't see the show last week, where uh, they announced the, the unveiling of Godless Bitches 2.0, <laughs> uh, which a lot of people are excited about seeing return to the to your podcast airwaves. So look for that. I think in f starting in February sometime. Yeah, people are asking us all the time uh, what's uh, like basically what happened to the godless bitches that hasn't been on for years, and that is a self-appointed label. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it is the uh, the show on the atheist. For the atheist community of Austin, that was uh, run and hosted all by women, uh, and uh, that is going to be starting up again. Um, and what else is going on for the ACA? Well, it's still early in the year. We got over all the stuff that we wanted to do last year, uh, so just the general stuff of running a business. Uh, more and more shows, probably, uh, because uh, we've, we've got this uh, great media platform that we have. We've been using it to spin off sort of a, uh, an extra uh, call and uh, Q&A show with Talk Heathen. And, of course, we've always got the nonprofits, which if you are not listening to that and subscribe to that, then please do. Uh, so, I... <laughs> I should turn down the thing on that. It can just vibrate for me. That means the <laughs> tweets are probably starting yeah, to Yeah, the in tweets now. are rolling in. Wow, this is fast. Okay, lots and lots of people already tweeting hashtag AXP topics. Uh, question, do you think that the internet problems are due to God's wrath? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> uh, will you ever do a show in the UK? Uh, yes, if you fly me out there. Or, or any of us, obviously. It doesn't have to just be me. <laughs> or, you, um, or you can watch it in the UK right now. Right? But yeah. I think he, but it, they if probably the question live is, show. Do a live show, then uh, you will have to help spring for it. Um, are there more audience questions? There are lots more <laughs> hashtag AXP topics, but uh, what's up, audience? We do. We have one more live audience question. Okay. Uh, this may be a little bit out of left field, uh, but uh, theists seem to take a... They like to grandstand on the subject of morality. They like to claim that territory as their own, as if uh, if you don't have religion, you cannot be moral. And uh, one of the chief things they seem to lean on is this concept of uh, you cannot get an ought from an is. Mm -hmm. And even though that fits on a bumper sticker quite nicely, uh, I've personally come to think that that's a false premise. But uh, And I have more to say on it, but since I'm not the host of a talk show, <laughs> I, won't, I won't go into it. Uh, but I, do, I just want to, I'm wondering uh, what your take on that uh, premise might be. Okay, well, hang on to that mic, because uh, usually this is uh, talk back and forth time. So uh, we don't want to just get a sentence and then drop you. Um, John, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, that's something that I've never really understood, um, why you need somebody to tell you what you ought to do in order to be moral. I think we're kind of hardwired uh, to, to be moral people, to, to be uh, cooperative, to you know, uh, get along with others, to help our survival as a species. And I think what religion has done is glommed on to what's already naturally there and said, uh, here, you wouldn't, be this, you wouldn't be this way if it wasn't for the religion or if it wasn't for the, you know, the God that we created to explain things. Um, I think it's just part of being human. And, uh, you know, and then you get into the Euthyphro dilemma and, you know, is it right because God says it's right or is it right already? Uh, independently from, from what you think your God says. And, uh, you know. Yeah, well, um, 
One of the things that I think that uh, I think atheists should never make the mistake of underplaying is the fact that morality is a very hard, complicated topic because uh, the topic of morality is basically about how uh, lots and lots of, you know, seven billion uh, people living in the world can uh, deal with each other uh, in, in a way that is fair and most importantly that as many people as possible uh, live a good, happy life as, as we can, as we possibly can. Um, those are, qu and the question of how you're supposed to act, um, to me, the idea that a, you should just uh, wait for a god to tell you what to do and then do that thing uh, is kind of an easy out answer because it absolves you of the question of thinking about why do you do those things. It's, well, the god says so, and, and my parents always told me to do whatever god says. Um, so, <clears throat> the, so applying morality to the question is not... 100% useless, it's maybe 98% useless, mm. but um, if you just want to get across to people, you should act this way, and you don't want to explain it, then you can just say, because God said so, the end. And if they go for that, uh, then, uh, then you've successfully changed their behavior. Here's the problem with that. If you are a bad person, uh, if you want to promote things that are objectively, or <laughs> objectively is a tricky word in this case, but actually De harmful to somebody. Demonstrably, maybe. Right, demonstrably. Um, if you want to do something that drags the sum total of human happiness downwards, if you want to hurt people, uh, if you want to improve your position in the world at the expense of others, Religion is also a really useful way to just get people to uh, do what you say. And so if you're a person with perceived but unearned moral authority, like let's say, oh, for the sake of argument, you're a Catholic priest and you say, uh, you know, give me your little kids and you can trust me because I'm a man of God. Uh, so, hey, look over there. <laughs> um, if you're somebody who d who you don't want to take too much uh, scrutiny or criticism, you can absolutely use religion uh, to get away with stuff. Um, and <sighs> uh, it. Uh, we're atheists, we don't think there is a God, and so any time that you say that you are doing what God says, we think you are ultimately doing what a person says. Now that doesn't mean, so that still leaves open a question of what should we do and how should we act? And uh, I think, as I said, this is an incredibly complicated question that moral philosophers have been dealing with forever since there have been moral philosophers. Um, there are lots of ways to approach the question. There's consequentialism where you decide what the consequences of your actions are and whether this would be in line or not in line with your goals and the goals of lots of other people. Um, there are basically a variety of ways that you can use to analyze your actions uh, and decide whether the things you're doing are good or not. Uh, but if you just say, if you just go with because I said so-ism, uh, then you are getting rid of the criteria and just deciding arbitrarily to uh, believe a particular person. And that can always lead a society into trouble because it leaves everybody vulnerable to what if that person becomes somebody very bad and corrupt. How, how, uh, does that answer your question? Well, it's uh, you've uh, said something, a lot of things that I agree with, and mm -hmm. uh, you've answered the uh, question in part. Uh, but uh, the specific uh, thing about uh, you cannot get an ought from an is. Okay. Uh, I mean, like, that's that was that was uh, that was the the focus of my question. But I, I 
was very interested in what you had to say about morality in general. But I mean, I believe that there are oughts that we get from is's. And I'd be happy to give you an example, but... Uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Well, I, I mean, I want to say, like, I agree with you to an extent. Um, although uh, when when people say you can't get an ought from an is, that partly uh, there there is some truth to that in the sense that uh, nobody can necessarily tell you what kind of values you should have. Like, if you are Hannibal Lecter, and what you really, really want is to eat everybody you meet, um, there is not necessarily an objective way for people uh, to stop you <laughs> from deciding that that's what you want. But the way that, a, that an effective society operates generally can't be, uh, like giving one person everything they want uh, when it harms everyone else because that ultimately does, because ultimately what we're trying to do is create a place that we want to live in, uh, a place where, where we will be the happy, uh, we, where we collectively will be the happiest. And I don't want to be eaten by Hannibal Lecter. So that's an instinct for somebody... self-preservation. <laughs> Yeah, and, and self-interest, and we don't have a we don't have a society full of Hannibal Lecters running around wanting to eat people. Generally, so no. It's, and it's not because <laughs> God says don't eat people, right? Right, but uh, but instincts that we have, which you, you touched right. on, things like self-preservation, self-interest, mm -hmm. uh, uh, spe uh, survival of the species, um, or uh, those are about as is as you get. Those in anything that you can call instinctual. That must be an is. That's not something that you derive that you ought to do. That's yeah, simply but, an I mean, instinct that I, you feel. It's, you I see could that an also, thing. I mean, you, you say that that's just the way things are, but I mean, I could also be a masochist who likes getting, uh, getting hurt. So, uh, you know, you can't necessarily make a blanket generalization about people. So, I mean, when it comes down to the question of what people like and what people want, uh, you can't necessarily dictate that. Uh, but suppose that you start from a position of, okay, our goal in society is to do so and so. You can set up rules that objectively get you towards the thing that you want or further from the, the thing that you want. And if that thing is measurable, like, I want people to live for as long as possible, to pick an, to pick an example. I want everybody to have the longest lifespan they can forget everything else. You can look at a set of rules and you can say, yeah, that gets us closer to that point. So so the answer to can you get an is from an ought is yes Way and around. no. <laughs> uh, you mean ought from an is? Yeah, that's what I meant. Well, I mean, if you have an instinct or not, that mm -hmm. state is an is, is it not? <laughs> yeah, um, to a certain can extent. Be, yeah, but it's complicated. I it, think I, I don't think it's purely instinctual, but I don't think it's. But, it's but if purely... someone does have an instinct, that's not something that they can't. That's not an ought. Uh, I... Whatever that instinct is, if your instinct is to be a mass murderer, that is still an is. Is uh, it not? Right. So, so I mean, and the, then the, you, the your behavior that, follows the, from that instinct. The fact that I don't want to die uh, happens to be just an is about me. Uh, but let's say that uh, let's say that John wants to kill me <laughs> for his own personal reasons. Uh, one of us is not going to get what we want. I hope it's John. <laughs> uh, and so the question of ought we let John kill me right now <laughs> or not uh, is not necessarily an, a question that we can objectively resolve unless we can settle on something that we as a as a group are trying to achieve with those rules country what or self preservation oh, can you hear me yeah, yeah. it would be contrary it would contradict my own instinct for self preservation if i allowed if i permitted a society in which a person could simply kill someone because they wanted to. Uh, right. if, what, because then they could kill me is, what if, if they wanted to. What if the society was just uh, you <laughs> can kill whoever you want and nobody else can? That, that is that one be, set of social rules. That's like uh, the kings of England. <laughs> right. right. Sure. Off with his head. 
and I don't find that particularly moral myself. Oh, but is your <laughs> is your personal feeling that that's not particularly moral? Uh, at, and is well, uh, <laughs> it certainly it certainly uh, creates an ought for me. For you, <laughs> I do. I, I most definitely <laughs> right. get an ought from that is okay. And so, and but in the people of England, for since I I, I brought up that example, but you know the right. off with his head crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, they're they believe that the king was the representative of God on earth. For one thing, they were right. they were anointed or some such. There was the, the divine right of kings. They believe that the king embodied the country. And therefore, they were all powerful. All of the people of England were owned by the king. So basically, <laughs> right. it was amoral to be, but that was from their belief. Right. That belief is an is, yeah. an ought. Well, I guess, I mean, it's, some is is an ought. Sometimes it's a gray area whether something is an is and an ought. But I'm, I'm, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Yeah, I, uh, we, we hate that idea because, uh, you know, our... Uh, <laughs> Our values, uh, which we definitely think of as an improvement over uh, over past values, uh, are out of line with monarchs. Uh, and I think that's great. I think that uh, that uh, measuring progress, and I th I think that if you go over uh, what we as a society have gained and uh, and how much better off most people are than they would have been during like uh, you know feudalism uh, then I think in that sense we have absolutely definitely improved and in that way I think that we have that we can objectively demonstrate that uh, that our set of rules is at least a, an improvement on what they had based on what we've accomplished. There's also, uh, you, can look in, you can look to the animal kingdom where uh, mm -hmm. a basic sense of fairness, when something is un, unfair, well, things ought to be more fair. Like, uh, you know, if you get, there was an experiment I saw recently uh, uh, where two animal, two monkeys were in a cage next to each other. I'll, I'll try to be brief, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but two monkeys right next to each other, they could see each other. Well, one was, uh, if they, they were trained, if they pushed a button, they would get food. One monkey would always get uh, cucumber, which is, you know, it'll fill, it'll, they can eat it, but it's bland. The other monkey would get grapes. And the monkey that got grapes was like, hey, it's great. But right. the monkey that got <clears throat> cucumbers, uh, even though the first time he got, the first couple of times he got a cucumber, he was okay with it. Suddenly, seeing the other guy getting grapes... Well, I mean, uh, he got very angry, and he would even, like, refuse and throw the cucumber away and say, where's my grape? Right. And that's, uh, that uh, that's displays a basic uh, instinctive uh, uh, sense of fairness, and that monkey clearly, if we, can if we can understand anything at all, that monkey certainly felt like he ought to get a grape because it was unfair for him to get cucumbers, not... And while the other one got grapes, and the yeah, sense of fairness is an ought, we or the, the, the belief that things should tend towards fairness is certainly an ought that yeah. you can get from an, the is. Um, I I think that a sense of fairness is absolutely something good to strive toward, but uh, there are a lot of complicated reasons why I think that's that is better, uh, which I could go ramble on about for a while, um, but. Uh, I don't think that the fact that something is based on is instinctually true necessarily means that it's a thing that we're going to aim at. Uh, in a lot of cases, what we see as oughts are happen to be in line with our instincts, but that's not always true. For instance, um, uh, when when you uh, when you look at evolutionary theory and and people talk in general terms. Like the idea of biological machines, <laughs> supposedly, uh, is to make more biological machines and crank out, you know, as many kids as they can, and to make life as viable as possible for their kids. That's fine as far as it goes, but a whole lot of atheists that I know are vo voluntarily child-free and not interested in having more kids. And you're not gonna, like tailor something around their instincts and say, okay, from now on the law is everybody have more kids. <laughs> yep. 
you know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't know if we lost the mic or if you're thinking oh. about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I was just uh, I was just yeah. thinking about uh, a law saying that we would have more kids. Well, the law is is it was different from morality. A morality is uh, basically you know something uh, a, a conclusion you arrive at basically yeah. that uh, about how things but the world ought to work. When it comes to a question of hey, I'm talking to an individual person, and should I tell him to have more kids or should I tell him not to have more kids? Instinct doesn't enter into it. There there are a lot of things I might base that advice on, but that one of the biggest ones is does that person. Uh, I'm not going to tell them because you have a biological instinct to procreate, you should definitely have as many kids as you can. Well, I guess where I'm having difficulty is I don't I don't see where morality comes into that question. If it, well, you're basic. That sounds like you're more expressing an opinion. Well, but a lot it, of but things. But I don't see that it's moral or immoral or even at best amoral. Well, okay, or, uh, I could does, make a case that about you your should. Opinion about I, children. I could make a case that you should not have more kids because if you the more kids you have, the more you contribute to the overpopulation problem, uh, which uh, may not immediately bite you, but it could be an issue in the next generation or two where it depletes the world's resources. Um, that would be an argument that has nothing necessarily to do with uh, just instincts, and also I could probably counter it with some arguments why you should go ahead and have more kids. I think, I mean, I think what yeah. that points out, though, is that, right. that, it, that it is complicated, like you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, that there's an instinctive part of it, which is, I think, what the monkey experiment shows is that there's, there's something inherent, <coughs> at least in primates, that wants a sense of fairness, that wants to survive, that wants to, uh, uh, that, you know, maybe not wants, but is in some sense naturally uh, cooperative and, um, and uh, you know, has a, has a sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then there's a, another component of that is that we make rational decisions on what you know what is better for the greater good, and I think definitely. And I think even that has an uh, kind of an, an innate instinctive part too, is is want the, that wanting uh, wanting to have things be for the greater good and not just the personal. You know what, what can I what can I get? Uh, so so yeah, I think it's both, and it's it's hard to say that the the monkey with the the cucumbers was objecting <laughs> objecting to that just because somebody you know wrote down a list of things that are right and wrong and said that this is you know it's wrong to you know to to have only some people get grapes and some people get cucumbers it's that, <laughs> you know they don't they don't uh, I don't think that a monkey is going to think about it in any kind of religious terms Right. Well, and I mean, you know, this doesn't even have to be an abstract question necessarily because there is a lot of uh, political disagreement about whether it's a good idea to uh, move society towards something where everything is more egalitarian or uh, if you're far on the uh, libertarian or conservative side, you might say, uh, you know, let absolutely everybody do what they want because... Uh, because the market will reward people who are good producers. And uh, so I am not saying all this to weigh in on my particular uh, political persuasion, but just the fact that there are very liberal and very conservative people in the world who all want to set up a system where their values play out demonstrates that there is a lot of tension in our society uh, to begin with uh, over how the rules should be set up and also what we are trying to accomplish. Uh, because I think a very conservative person would say, I don't care if that monkey feels like he should have gotten a grape. Uh, the fact is the monkey who got the grape got the grape, and if you are just doing handouts of grapes to monkeys, then uh, you're going to create a dependence. 
<laughs> that sounds like a big beefy rationalization on the part of the grape owners of the society. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm that, not saying this is what I think. That I'm monkey just worked to, for that grape. They yep. hoarded all the grapes. <laughs> right, and he's now a grape producer. Now, everyone, well, I have all the grapes I have, so, you know, and also it snowed right. in, in where I am, so global warming, warming is mm. solved, right? Sorry, that was a yes. tangent, but we do have another yeah. studio question, so I don't want to I don't want to monopolize the, all the time. Okay, uh, we have another studio question. My cool. name is David, by the way. I don't think thanks, I, David. I said. Hi, David. And, um, uh, Craig has a question. Okay, well, I'll get to you in a sec, Craig. But I want to give the people on Twitter a turn. Go to another tweet. Yeah. All right. Uh, so hashtag AXP topics. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to to hit some of these briefly and then get back to the audience. Uh, Peter on Twitter says, I'm an agnostic, atheist, secular humanist. What's your opinion on excessive use of different labels beyond atheist? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a problem with hmm. picking whatever labels you want to dis describe yourself. Yeah, people can call themselves what they want to. Uh, I uh, sort of agree with David Silverman that uh, if you can call yourself an atheist, then it's a good idea because it raises visibility to non-belief. But I also disagree with David Silverman that you have some kind of moral obligation to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly I'm in favor of people calling themselves what they want to. Uh, and uh, I just think that when you label yourself something, you should do your best to make yourself understood about what you mean by that. Yeah. Uh, one more uh, from Ben Jamin on Twitter. Approaching those who strongly defend irrational beliefs with the it's real to me, I experienced it attitude. For example, alien abduction, out-of-body experiences, personal revelation. I hope you see what I mean. I'd love to call also one day. Thanks for your question, Ben. Uh, so again, the question is, what do you say to a person who's just uh, who just bats away everything with, well, it happened to me and I believe it? Um, there's really not much to talk about at that point. I, you know, I would just say, okay, um, but if you want to convince me that it's true, sure. you're going to have to come up with something other than that because uh, an anecdote isn't isn't evidence. Right, and. Uh, you know, the, the fact that a person is convinced that they got abducted by aliens doesn't really tell us anything beyond, okay, you're convinced. And if that's all he's going to say to you, then there's nothing to talk about, really. Uh, it's the question of what actually happened and the question of whether you care or not that you believe things that are true. Uh, where you actually have to discuss something. And I think most people realize that it happened to me and I believe it isn't a way to convince other people if it didn't happen to them. Right. All right. Uh, what was it, Craig? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Craig. Yeah, I've been noticing that it seems <laughs> like uh, society's getting dumber all the time. <laughs> and, um. Uh, it seems like also we're getting more religious education in our schools, and okay. Trump seems to be interested in uh, further <clears throat> eroding the separation between church and state, and just wondered what you had to say about some of that. Uh, whether we're getting dumber over time is kind of relative, because, I mean, you know, I spend all day working on, uh, uh, like, web development, and that is not something that would have been possible if I lived... 200 years ago, I mean, well, I mean, 20 years ago, but if you think about uh, the level that our technological advancement has changed in any period of time, uh, it's not necessarily that we as people are getting smarter, but I think that we are building more and more uh, more and more uh, of our knowledge base on things that people have already done before us. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about something called the Flynn effect, which means that uh, if, if you, I, um, I'm gonna get this wrong and I have no internet with me <laughs> right now, but uh, as I've heard, the Flynn effect means that when they measure things like IQ or however, like 
measuring intelligence can be kind of subjective in general, mm -hmm. uh, but when you take IQ measurements and you factor out like like knowledge that is directly coming from your social circumstances, like I know very little about 1960s TV shows because I don't live in the 60s, but when you take intelligence tests over time, they have to keep adjusting the scale because there is a demonstrated effect that people seem to keep getting smarter and have more knowledge base. Um, now, I'm not gonna say, <laughs> I'm certainly going to agree that in the short term, there are some big wiggles in that graph. Uh, people certainly do get dumber over short periods of time. Climate change. <laughs> what? Climate change would be an example of how it seems that people are ignoring science that's staring them in the face uh, in, yeah. in light of their religion pointing them in another yeah, direction. Some people just right. don't value <laughs> science as much as other people do. Yeah, although I'm pretty sure some people have always been stubbornly ignorant. Uh, one of the reasons why the Flynn effect might exist is because uh, like the very fact that there is climate change at all is something we had no idea about a hundred years ago. Uh, and so just the fact that there is more knowledge and information out there by itself means that there are more people who have accepted and absorbed this information. Uh, yeah, it, as a, as a, as a, yeah. as a, as humanity, uh, we have much more access to information and to education, and you know, than we did a hundred years ago. And so, I don't, I don't know if I would agree that we, as a, as a species, are getting collectively dumber. Perhaps what I'm thinking is that it's more about uh, the fact that there's so much anti-science education within the systems of education in our country that For sure. people are maybe smart still, but they're looking around these issues that are really more political than uh, scientific. Yeah. I, I definitely think that's true. I'm just not sure if it, it, I'm just not clear on whether it is worse than it has been in the past. Because, you know, there was a time in history when people were burning witches. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen a lot of that lately. I've seen a lot of bad stuff that sometimes makes me despair for the future of humanity. <laughs> um, but I think that no matter what time you live in, uh, uh, there's going to be a group of ignorant people who push back against uh, uh, progress. Right. Is it more so in the United States than in Europe? It seems like they have a little more of an understanding of global warming than uh, this side of the earth does. Um, I'm sure they have their pockets of ignorance, too. <laughs> I'm, I know for sure that they have their pockets of ignorance, too. Um, <clears throat> whether they have more of it or less of it, uh, I, I don't think I can objectively say, because I've heard some pretty <laughs> ridiculous shit coming out of British people on occasion, but maybe not on, on the order of magnitude. <laughs> Uh, to uh, go to a different subject, if I may, uh, yeah. you know, being from an era where the moral majority took over society. Ah, uh, good old 80s. <laughs> I, I can't help but think that uh, religion became much more derisive since then. What do you mean? Well, that uh, we all hate each other more now <laughs> if you're not the right religion. So I, I, I'm sorry, divisive. This actually touches on a topic that I that I have brought up in my uh, fake news talks. Um, you know, the uh, there's a few different secular student alliances who who will probably remember this when I brought it to them. And also, if you want to get in touch with me and and bring me out to give this talk, it's pretty good. Um, but. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, drawn a lot, tried to draw a lot of attention to as a technology professional is that uh, the internet has has serious, far-reaching effects on the way we think and relate to each other, um, and in some ways, it's very good because, like as we've been saying. There's more information out there, and the internet provides an easier way of getting access to it and learning stuff. Uh, if you care about 
uh, reality and truth. Um, but another effect that the internet has is to uh, draw together the tremendous number of people who exist in the world, uh, and that means it, people have a very bad sense of scale. Uh, and if there are like 50 people in the entire world who believe that, um, let me see, <laughs> Uh, grapes. <laughs> I, I'm trying to tie it back to something else, but you know, <laughs> if a bunch of people believe that uh, grapes are toxic and that everybody who has ever eaten a grape uh, suffered instant death, and everybody who says that they ate a grape are actually part of a worldwide grape conspiracy, sounds like uh, the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well. But a lot of people believe the Bible. I'm saying 50 people in the world believe in this massive grape conspiracy where everybody's conspiring against them to try to get them to eat this instant death poison. Um, but what happens is the internet can create a grapes are poison community. Uh, and then all 50 of those people can come together. And even though they're a very, 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 very tiny portion of the entire world population, they can get together and interact and communicate with each other and reinforce their beliefs and, and tell each other stories like, yeah, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody whose grandmother died eating a grape. Uh, and they will build up uh, sort of an arsenal of these stories and uh, they can, by just hunkering down in those little communities, become more and more impenetrable to facts. And I think that's a big part of why uh, like if you even if you just go by polling, there's a lot more divisiveness and a lot more uh, extremism, uh, like at this particular moment than there has been maybe in some other recent decades. I, st I still think though that the religious right is a, is a fringe. Yeah. It's a, it's a, for sure. It's a very well funded, loud, uh, you know. Uh, noisy fringe, but it's still a fringe nonetheless, and it's just that we they're in our face a lot, so we hear about it a lot, and we have to deal with it politically in this country. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I don't think it's really, you know, we, we and back in the 80s, we used to say the, mo the moral majority is neither, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's still the case today. In fact, it's, you know, they may, they, they, they've, they've had to fight so many fronts while society progresses. You know, we, really have, we have marriage equality, we have, yeah. and, and, they, and they're clinging very hard at, at maintaining the old ways, but ultimately losing. So I think that's, that's good news for the society. And I, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't think it's getting worse. I think, it, you know, it goes in waves and we definitely have, uh, you know, we definitely have ups and downs, but I think we're making progress. I mean, in, in some ways, like, I do think that it's getting worse sometimes because, like, uh, it's been a long time since I've seen a candidate like Roy Moore, for example, who, for those of you living outside the U.S. politics bubble, was an Alabama politician with a, with a lot of very extremist fundamentalist religious views. Uh, in the past, he's defied court orders and, and uh, like brought in Ten Commandments monuments and, and was a judge and made rulings explicitly based on stuff and then like basically got shot down by the Supreme Court and defied their orders and eventually had their judgeship stripped. But it really, really looked like he was going to become the Senate next senator from Alabama. And then a bunch of revelations also came out about him molesting very young women. Uh, and it still looked like he was going to become a senator from Alabama. In fact, some people, according to polls, said they were more likely to vote for him because he was being persecuted for the molesting girls. I think it's just much more visible now, though, because right. because of the internet and because well, the media. That. I think the Roy Moores have always been there. It's just that it, it wasn't uh, all that noticeable on a national scale. Uh, you know, you had Klan members running the the southern state uh, politicians. You know, just fifty years ago or whatever. And I think it, that's it's true. Just, we have more attention. A guy like Roy Moore can't 
kind of stay under the radar and, and get into politics quite as easily because more people are watching. Yeah, but I'm not sure if that's the whole story because, I mean, you know, we've had sort of a global media and, uh, and a, a very common use of the Internet for, let's say, uh, you know, at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Roy Moore seemed to be a new low to me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, but I guess that's all we will say right now. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let, let me check. Uh, uh, Mark in the control room has been tweeting me, or, or excuse me, texting me uh, highlights from things that have been tweeted. Um, <clears throat> can you comment? Uh, well, let's see. Yeah. Can you comment on the show that Leo, Leo Ramini does with regard to Scientology? Will it help to take it down or will it really have no effect? Do you think... Oh, wait. This is a different question now. Um, so Leo Ramini is an actress who was involved with Scientology. I haven't read a lot of her stuff, although, I mean, I thought she was an okay actress. Um, and she's apparently come out with some with some tell-all stuff about the Church of Scientology. And the question is, will it help to take it down? I think it'll it'll help spread some awareness. I've I think I've only seen one of her episodes or one of her programs on that. And and I was you know and, and my thought was, yeah, this is good. You know, the yeah. to get that information out there so people can kind of be aware of what's going on. Same with the the Mormon religion and some of the some of the, what I consider wacky aspects of that, that people aren't that aware of because, you know, you have, you have uh, actors and f famous people uh, be being a part of this. And for better or worse, people who are in the public eye tend to have more influence than other people. So, you know, uh, I think the more, the more information you can get out there on what these things are really about, uh, the better off we are. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say if, if it will take it down because, like, information about how bad Scientology is has been out there for a long time. Uh, I think it will certainly uh, improve things for the opponents of Scientology. Um, in general, I think that when you have a cult that's uh, hurting people, uh, the more information you can get out there about their cult-like activities, the better things will be. Uh, and yet, as we just discussed in the last question, sometimes things can be really, really obvious to people. I, I mean, all the information can be right in their face, and they'll just double down on the stuff that they believe Part of it being because they can hunger down in these little internet communities and reinforce each other's uh, beliefs that are completely out of whack with reality. Um, I don't know if Scientology will ever completely go away, although I think there's probably a critical threshold where if, the, if interest in Scientology or the level that they're taken seriously drops below some, uh, some threshold then it will just sort of die out for lack of uh, for lack of uh, effort or ability. Uh, but I mean, hey, I I imagine that the Church of Scientology already has more resources and more messaging power than maybe even the entire worldwide atheist community. <laughs> I mean, when you when you add up the influence of uh, the atheist community of Austin and all the YouTubers and all the, you know, and all the authors and American atheists and, and these bigger secular groups, Scientology might even have more clout than they do. And yet we are <laughs> hoping for the atheist movement to continue growing and getting more influence. So you never know. <laughs> well, and also the other side of that coin is is when you focus on say, you know, look how wacky Scientology is or look how wacky Mormonism is. And, the, and then you have people in mainstream religion saying, you know, <laughs> boy, those people are, are really weird. You know, they don't believe normal stuff like talking snakes and, uh, <laughs> and that kind of thing. And, and so yep. it sort of creates a, 
it, it almost reinforces the more liberal mainstream religions, which, you know, what's the difference between a religion and a cult? Uh, it's, it's not really a, it's not really a, a, a definitive billion, line. A it's, billion followers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when does it become a religion? And so, you know, Scientology has become more mainstream. Yeah. But, uh, right. Christianity does not make any more objective sense than Scientology because it has more followers. Uh, Islam does not make more objective sense than Mormonism because it has more followers. So uh, the number of people who are willing to go all in on an idea doesn't necessarily uh, have anything and uh, have anything to do with uh, the amount of criticism that it gets or the amount of sense that it makes. Um, <laughs> people are complicated. Uh, I'm going to read another thing that was highlighted by Mark uh, via uh, via my text messages. Um, Russell, do you think there might be a link to religious belief and susceptibility to fake news, i.e., is the prevalence of a religion contributing to a general lack of skepticism that is making many of us prone to fake news stories of all types? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I bet there's a correlation just because I think the general practice of, uh, of not being skeptical about things, of taking stuff at face value, uh, both leads to falling for religions more and also falling for fake news more. So that if someone in your bubble forwards you a story that just totally different didn't happen, if you're not a person who who tends to check stories and and look for some kind of verifiable source or or find out how they knew that or look for corroboration if you don't do that you're more likely to just uncritically forward fake news and also coincidentally not coincidentally you're more likely to uh fall for some cultish stuff well, in addition to that, religion actually reinforces uh, a, l a lack of skepticism and scrutiny, and it it, yeah. uh, it it you know it actively discourages people from from thinking. You know, faith is a virtue, and uh, if an authority tells you to do something, and we were talking about before, is it's God decides what's <laughs> right and wrong, and don't think about it. You know, just do it, and so yeah, I think that. Not only are you more likely to be less skeptical, but you're actually encouraged to be less skeptical if you're involved with religion. Yeah. Uh, let's not forget also that, um, you know, this polls, statistics show, and again, I have no internet, <laughs> but uh, belief, in religion, belief in religion is very clearly on a downward trend in the United States. Um, it was, I mean, I mean, it has, the number of people who say that they do not practice any religion has, I think, doubled in the last uh, 20 years or so, something like that. Uh, now, a caveat being that just saying you don't follow any religion doesn't make you an atheist. Uh, there are there are lots of people who say they're spiritual. There are lots of people who says who say, well, I'm not part of an organized religion because God talks to me personally, and uh, you know I just know this stuff. Um, the, all those people are counted among the nuns, the people who have none as their religion, no religion, uh, but. Uh, overall, the fact that people are are basically ditching religion is a positive trend, um, and so you couldn't, you certainly couldn't say people are getting more susceptible to fake news, and that's tied to the fact that they're more religious, because they actually are less religious. And there's also confirmation bias. If if I look at a news story that says something that I like, I'm more likely to not dig into it anymore and see if it's actually <coughs> true or not. If, yeah. it, if it's something I don't agree with, then I'm going to, you know, search for things that refute it. So I think a lot of that's going on, too. Yeah. And one thing I absolutely don't want atheists to do is just think, oh, well, I'm a skeptical person, so, uh, y you know, I'm, I'm always right. Because 
there are plenty of atheists who I see on social media uncritically uh, talking, you know, un uncritically retweeting or reposting things that they saw that uh, speak to their biases, exactly like you said. Uh, and not only that, when you call them out and you give them like a, a link that demonstrates that this that this isn't the whole story or that it's super inaccurate or or it's just an urban legend, a lot of times those people will double down and and fight on it more or even say like, well, even if it isn't true, they they could have said that. And that doesn't really help the skepticism movement in general, I think. Uh, do we have anyone else in the audience who wants to talk, or should I dip back into Twitter? Looks like no. <laughs> um, okay, where's my Twitter? <laughs> I think we've done, pr <laughs> I think we've vamped pretty well, all things considered. Uh, there's a ton of tweets. I'm gonna I'm gonna go okay. through these later, even if All we right. don't cover them, just because it's interesting. Yeah. Why don't you? Uh, I, I mean, read through them, and then you can take the next topic. But I'm just gonna go to some of the most recent ones. Uh, let's see. Uh, the after school. Pro okay, Belinda Bridget six minutes ago tweeted uh, the after school programs in Oklahoma called Whiz Kids. Under-resourced children are being sent from public schools to churches to get indoctrinated. Please help make this not happen anymore. Uh, I don't know what Whiz Kids is. Uh, apparently, <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so so it's an after-school program that they have set up, I guess, by law, saying that they uh, don't have. Okay, so their public schools in Oklahoma, I'm going to assume, are not very good. Uh, that may be just a bias on my part. <laughs> uh, but then they're, they're saying, oh, well, these schools aren't working for kids. They're not educating them, so might as well send them to church where, where they'll do better. <sighs> um, the... <laughs> Again, I always try not to dip too much into my personal political beliefs, even though I do sometimes. Uh, but I think that this is definitely kind of a, an insidious side effect of underfunding education. I mean, um, when there's <clears throat> when there's no standards by which you set uh, uh, like what constitutes a proper education for a kid. Churches are always waiting in the wings to just jump in and say, we'll do it for you. And by the way, uh, you know, as part of your education, okay, Timmy, two plus two is four. Uh, <laughs> uh, Austin is the capital of Texas. Uh, and grapes are instant poison that will kill you when you eat them. <laughs> Take your pick. Uh, that sounds like a terrible idea, but you already knew that, I'm sure. Grapes are poisonous, toxic <laughs> to some extent to dogs. I found that out recently. I never uh, knew that. Okay. Grape, grapes and raisins. But uh, yeah, I'm not that familiar with whiz kids. It, it sounds like it's just, uh, it's like after school religion that they cart kids <coughs> off to. If, uh, you know, my guess would be it's with parental permission so they can get around it being compulsory. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, if they're just doing that with every kid, then that's a, that's a serious church state separation issue and I would definitely get the ACLU or the F Freedom from Religion Foundation involved with that because that's that's all right that's no go I'll be, I, possibly against my better judgment I'm gonna just go to their page and read their propaganda self description uh, uh, and then maybe I'm gonna pull back and try to find a news story about it uh, we're whiz kids Oklahoma for over 22 years we provided mentors friends and role models for under-resourced children in Oklahoma City and have helped them learn to read churches all okay and uh, here's a link to Ugh. <laughs> Whiz kids couldn't happen without the support of our partners in the community, churches, businesses, and schools. Although the headline that led me here was, churches all over o OKC are hosting Whiz kids each week. But then, uh, but then when I go to the actual story, they say, churches 
and businesses and schools. So try to drag in other groups, but it sounds like they're definitely first and foremost a church organization. Uh, so that's the pro whiz kids stuff. Uh, okay, and I'm, uh, doing live web searches on the air is not great. <laughs> so yeah, if we had you on the phone, we could have you tell us more about it, and we, yeah. we could make maybe talk about it more intelligently. But yeah, there, sounds there's like just a, pages and pages of of propaganda here, so it's uh, yeah. Sounds like it could be a constitutional issue, depending on how it's structured. But there, you right. know, churches have gotten really good at. at <clears throat> Figuring out what they can do and what they can't do, and skirting the, yeah, you know, skirting the the law so that they can still indoctrinate. And to be clear, I mean, churches are welcome to teach kids to read <laughs> with their own resources. I mean, I, I think teaching kids to read and teaching kids to do math would almost certainly be doing whatever else they'd normally be doing in their church. Um, but the issue comes in when this comes under the banner of this is what. Uh, you know, th this is your education now. This is what we're going to uh, support with your tax dollars because that's basically unconstitutional for us. And you know, after school mentoring and tutoring is a good thing, but they, you know, they always combine that with a side order of Jesus, and that's right. kind of where I start to object. It's you know, it's one thing to teach a kid to read, but uh, you know, to use that as an avenue to proselytize children, you know, I start to object to that. Now, if their parents want them to get proselytized, then you get into that, you know, parental rights. Yeah, actually. But, but if it's publicly funded, <clears throat> you know, they need to keep that those things separate, I think. Yeah, that actually ties into a question that uh, Mark forwarded to me uh, much earlier in the show. Uh, the question was, in your opinion, at what point does religious indoctrination of children become child abuse and why? That's a complicated question, too. <laughs> <laughs> we both have kids, right? Yeah. Um, because I know so many atheists who, who don't have kids and don't want any, I feel like, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of uh, atheists, when they're presenting their opinions, go way further out on the let's stop parents from doing stuff uh, that will harm their kids bandwagon. Um, I am not saying that religious indoctrination can, uh, does not often rise to the level of child abuse. It absolutely does. Um, what I do feel as a parent is that all parents, I assume somewhat like me, are just muddling around not knowing what the hell they're doing and are guaranteed to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and when it comes to teaching kids the way the world is, they can only teach the stuff that they know in many cases. And if they are uh, religiously indoctrinated themselves, then the parents may be ultimately as much the victims as the child. And so you can't necessarily solve it by jumping on every case and saying CPS has got to take the kids away. But totally, there are, there are ways to cross that line, and they happen all the time. Uh, when you actually... Like, telling your kid something that's wrong, uh, <clears throat> I feel like I'm, I'm going to get a lot of uh, argument and pushback on this one. So I'm trying to be careful. Uh, there, there is a difference between making a dumb mistake and doing something that rises to the level of child abuse legally. And what rises to the level of child abuse conceptually is definitely something where we have to, room to argue a lot. Yeah. What do you think? It's, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be the mantra for the show today. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, like you said, it, uh, some things can rise to, to that level. I think telling a, a child that they're going to burn in hell forever is abusive. Yeah. Um, but at what level should the law step in is, the, is what's complicated. You know, right. Obviously, if a child is being hit and beaten, that's you know that's child abuse. But mental, there's you know mental and emotional abuse exists too, and uh, it's not always obvious at what level telling a kid that something that's factually wrong or even arguable, but the parent believes it is abusive. I think most parents are doing the best they can. 
Uh, they love their children. They just m might be misguided. Uh, yeah. You know, I think atheists also <laughs> can do things that are misguided. And, uh, you know, at, at what point the law steps in is uh, probably a matter of a lot of debate and scrutiny. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of uh, issues that uh, that atheists disagree about among each other. Uh, for instance, everybody I ask, every parent I ask about whether they've taught their kid about Santa Claus seems to have a different answer and a different reason for going that way. Uh, I personally did not go with the Santa Claus myth and I don't necessarily, I, I don't personally advise anyone to uh, teach their kids about Santa Claus, but this isn't a big enough issue for me that I feel like getting in a fight with any parents who who say, oh, but without Santa Claus, we wouldn't have an opportunity to use their childlike wonder and, and enhance their appreciation of the holidays and family. And I mean, I may think that's a load of bunk, but I'm certainly not going to try to take their kids away for that. Right. Uh, and I don't think the arguments are so bad that I would even fight them very hard on the whole Santa Claus thing. Uh, <laughs> maybe I think that just teaching some religious belief, like maybe I think that some political beliefs are so harmful <laughs> that... Uh, that they're worse than just teaching your kids that Jesus loves you or whatever. Uh, but but again, that's just me. And I, one of my values is that you don't necessarily get to impose your personal preferences on on people unless it rises to the level of something very serious and harmful, which some religion does. Again. <laughs> You got anything good there? And uh, if uh, anyone in the audience decides they do have a question after all, feel free to start jumping up and down or something. Uh, what's going on over on hashtag AXP topics? We've gotten a couple questions about Egypt's latest move to pass a law that would make atheism illegal. I'm not familiar with that, are you? Uh, nope, I'm sorry, we don't know everything, but I'm against it. That's something I'm going to look up because I didn't. Okay. I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, we. Well, keep doing that. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, okay, Amy Jackson, 24 minutes ago. What do you do with the "you were never a Christian" argument based on the idea that Jesus never lost anyone who was his? Uh, <clears throat> well, neither one of us I mean, ever were Christians. That's true. We weren't. <laughs> so we are uniquely bad people to ask that question. I was never a Christian, so I don't, I don't care. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I think that's a fallacy. That's, uh, that's the, the no right. true Scotsman fallacy, that if you do something that a, a Christian doesn't think is in line with Christianity, then you were never a Christian. That just... Yeah. Um... The problem is, of course, that there aren't any objective standards for how, for whether somebody was actually a Christian or not. For me, I tend to take people's claim that they're a Christian as at face value because uh, identifying as a Christian is the only way I know to <laughs> uh, demonstrate that somebody is really a Christian. So if somebody tells me I was a Christian, um, then I believe, yeah, they were a Christian. Now, this means different things to a lot of people. Uh, it could mean, uh, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross and rose three days later to absolve me of my sins. But then there's a lot of people with a very wide range of opinions who also say that they're Christians and maybe don't take any of that seriously or maybe say you can't be a Christian unless you specifically believe that communion wafers literally become the flesh of Jesus Christ when you put them in your mouth. Uh, there are lots of Christians who tell each other that they're not Christians. Uh, so I guess what it comes down to is I would tell those people if they raised it in an argument, uh, I have no opinion about what true Christian means. Uh, and if you are gatekeeping that many Christians, then first of all, 
uh, there's hardly anyone in the world who agrees with you. Every time you narrow the definition of Christian, uh, you you uh, reduce the believability and credibility or and popularity, I guess, of the Christian religion. But then again, a lot of Christians want that because it makes them feel better if they're persecuted. So, you're not one of those 1821 Lutheran <laughs> synod heretics, are you? Yeah. Rather no. than an 1852. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I got I got a text right. from my wife. Okay. Uh, Bring home bread and milk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you got? Yeah, this is a good question. So, <laughs> hi, Lori. Nepotism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nope, go on. Could you be close friends with a Christian without needing to change them or condemn them? Yes. Uh, uh, of course, it, it depends. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it depends on how close the friendship is and how much they are willing to work with you. But, I mean, I can think of at least two very good friends uh, of mine, uh, one of whom is uh, Kyle, who is a who is a Baptist pastor I had on the show uh, years ago, and uh, uh, oh, yeah, the remember. show the show was kind of kind of meh, but we're still friends and occasionally get together for breakfast. Uh, and I also have uh, a friend who's uh, uh, running for something, and I contributed to him and. I, I would kind of like to promote him and, and fundraise for him, but I'm not gonna because that's real dicey with our nonprofit status. Mm. Uh, but he's he's a real Christian and uh, and I like him and mostly the th the things that he thinks that aren't about Christianity are totally simpatico with things I think. So yeah, yeah. it is. And I would say yes too. I, <coughs> uh, I don't in general, feel any need to change or convert anybody. That's the, that's not why I'm here. That's not why I do this show. Uh, I think it, whether you can be friends or not depends on y your common interests. It depends on uh, if if my lack of belief was a problem for them, that, you know, that, that could probably interfere with a friendship. Uh, if they felt the need to change or convert me, I probably, <coughs> I probably wouldn't want to to have a relationship like that. But just the fact that somebody believes stuff different from what I believe is, is uh, generally not a problem unless that's their primary focus in all interactions is to spread the word or whatever, then, then that would get in the way. Right. But the fact that they just believe something that I don't agree with is not, is not a big issue. Yeah. And it's okay with me if they needle me occasionally about being an atheist or, or make, make little jokes like, you know, oh, well, that wouldn't be a problem for you if you accepted Jesus. <laughs> like, I expect to take a certain amount of shit from my friends. Uh, <laughs> the, I don't have any friends who agree with me 100% on everything, and most of my friends have good senses of humor. I mean, heck, even my coworkers like can't go through a day without people giving you little, taking little shots or insults or, or uh, you know, <laughs> saying, "Well, your mom, something, something." Um, <laughs> I have a very juvenile work environment, <laughs> um, but. Uh, but if that person can't have a conversation with me without uh, trying to convert me, then they're probably not a person that I choose to spend a lot of time with. Uh, out, <laughs> at Out of Pancake Mix <laughs> says, uh, how do you deal with creationists ignoring fundamentalists? Oh, okay. So people who are creationists but not fundamentalists that use science to explain how God created the universe. Mm. So <laughs> the well, let me see. So the, so creationist covers a wide amount of territory uh, and and there are a lot of people who use what sounds like science or what is their understanding of science to try to advance their their belief in God as being logical or scientific. Um, 
Often the way that those people are most effective is when they have a familiarity with the current state of scientific knowledge and they're able to uh, recognize holes that are, that are in our knowledge, things that scientists don't know yet, uh, stuff that may never be discovered in principle, and then use that as their little gap to wedge in, oh, well, that's where God would fit in. Uh, we don't know how so-and-so did it. We, we don't know how so-and-so happened, but uh, saying that there's an all-powerful being who can do anything is a neat explanation for that. Um, and I think what I, would, what I would always say to that is uh, that is a lazy explanation to that. <laughs> yeah. and some, sometimes it's even lazier than that. It's, um, well, I, I believe that evolution by natural selection is is the process that explains all the diversity of life on Earth. But God's the one who chose that method to, to populate the Earth. <laughs> right. Well, how do you know that? <laughs> and yeah. That's just, that's just uh, taking what we know from scientific knowledge and just sticking God in there because you want God to be the source of it. But it doesn't explain anything, and, and the God hypothesis isn't scientific at all. So it doesn't help, uh, help us understand anything. Yeah. Uh, one of the points my dad made to me once, uh, my dad is a computational f physicist, and I always enjoy <laughs> bragging about that a little bit. Um, but uh, one of the things my dad once pointed out is that in order to be acceptable as a scientific explanation, it, it doesn't have to, I, I mean, it has to not only explain uh, the phenomenon you're observing, but it also has to be precise enough to rule out uh, competing explanations. So, um, you know, the the fact that the uh, that the sun is a giant ball of gas that is that is real far away from the Earth uh, is an impressive bit of information that our s species has come across. But what's really impressive is that we have. Uh, specific ways that we measure that that have that have actually demonstrated that have actually shown us to a certain order of magnitude of precision how big the sun is, how far away the sun is, uh, and nailing down those numbers. Actually, I mean, you know, in the old days there was still the belief that the sun went around the Earth, um, and and they came up with these elaborate systems uh, to explain how the sun moves in sort of inconsistent ways with that explanation. Uh, and the beauty of the Earth going around the sun uh, is that we can like make hypotheses and tests that are so specific that we can uh, we can get exact measurements of not just there is a ball out there, but it is precisely this far away, and if you tweak those a little bit, then uh, it's not compatible with observed facts. Or if you change the model, it's not compatible with observed facts. And the problem with the God e explanation is uh, it's compatible with everything. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, if it turned out that the Earth, like, like God is compatible with the Earth going around the sun, but if it turned out we've been wrong all along and the sun really does go around the Earth, God would explain that too. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it explains everything equally well, but it doesn't shed any new light on any problems. It doesn't provide any precision. It doesn't provide any further information. It's just something you can plug into any question and feel like you've answered it. Which pretty makes it redundant or, or right. at least superfluous to what it is you're trying to investigate. Yeah, it's a useless answer. Hmm. All right, we have almost made it all the way through this show. <laughs> Uh, Thank you all for giving us stuff yes. to talk about. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, we, we appreciate really our appreciate fans. all you people. Uh, and again, uh, after the show is over, there's no reason to ever tweet AXP topic, <laughs> hashtag AXP topics, until, of course, the next time our uh, phone runs out. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and of course, if you would like to help ensure that that doesn't happen for as long as possible, then you are welcome to donate with the little button on top of YouTube, or you can check out uh, atheist-community.org for some donations there, or go to Facebook. We're all over the place. Anyway, uh, we've probably got time for a few more tweets. Do you have any ones you particularly love? I haven't picked one yet. Do we, all right. do we have anything else from the audience? <laughs> Okay, um, Samantha Smith says, I'm a former Pentecostal minister, now an atheist, but my husband and I have yet to be open about being atheist because uh, of our family's heavy emphasis on Christianity and because of its stigma here in the Bible Belt. How can we be open and meet criticisms healthily? <laughs> well, that's such an open-ended question. It's, yeah. it, it's, it depends on how your family would react to it. It depends on how, uh, how you want your relationship to your family to be. Uh, we, we get a lot of people who call in and say if they came out as atheists, they would be, you know, say it's a, a teenager, they would be kicked out of the house. Well, and we've seen case, enough cases to know that that could be absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, and so we would, you know, I would advise that person to not come out because your, you know, your your personal safety is is in danger. Um, but you know, if you're on your own and and your family can handle disagreements or uh, that sort of thing amicably, and it's not uh, it's not going to uh, be a real burden on your life or on your you know relationships, then. Then you could bring it up, or you, you know, there's lots of different things you could do. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily always healthy to tell everybody what you think about everything, uh, but to tend to kind of choose what's, you know, what's important as far as is what you reveal in that relationship. Yeah, uh, if you want some reassurance that you know, don't worry, your family won't ostracize you, and you won't lose all your friends. I can't give you that assurance. It may be true. Uh, you, I've heard some people who turned out to be very lucky. I know uh, at least one person who uh, her, she and her husband were both believers. Uh, what, yeah, I, I know. I, I remember who I'm thinking of because the, the couple comes to uh, uh, ACA dinners at Star of India every once in a while. Um, they were both believers. Finally, one of them said, I can't take it anymore. I haven't believed in God for a while. And the other one said, me neither. <laughs> uh, it was a beautiful story. Uh, it happens sometimes. A lot of times by outing yourself as an atheist, you, uh, you flush out uh, other people in your life who, are, who have also been closeted. And that's one reason why it's great to come out as an atheist. But... We know the other kind of story. Uh, we know people whose whose lives were upended uh, by uh, by revealing themselves and getting a whole lot of uh, pushback from the the people who they thought were their friends uh, and the family who now want nothing to do with them anymore. So. I don't know if I have any advice because the only thing you can really do is try it and find out. <laughs> um, and I wish things weren't that way. Yeah. Great. What? Uh, uh, we can't hear you. We're not hearing the microphone. Is it on? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I don't know if it's coming across. Testing, testing. Uh, oh, yeah, there, there, there it is. Oh, right. You were yeah. out of uh, Bluetooth range or something? <laughs> I, think so. I don't know. The audience just wanted to also uh, suggest the clergy project. The clergy right. project. Uh, yeah, I always forget to. <laughs> <laughs> to pitch them. Yeah, that's that's the community part of uh, Atheist Community of Austin. The, Absolutely. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick question. Um, yes. Just diving back into things. Um, you had mentioned um, Christianity co-opting uh, the uh, the after-school programs earlier mm -hmm. in the show. Right. Yeah. Um, it's just funny that they co-opt the the, uh, the outside businesses, but they never goes the other way around. <laughs> Right, I mean, they're the ones who say Judeo-Christian, but I've never met a Jewish person who said Judeo-Christian. Or right. Christ of Jewish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they never do that. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I mean, 
<laughs> it's funny because they especially always talk about Judeo-Christian values when they say, we demand that you all say Merry Christmas from now on. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of Jews out there going, what are you talking about, Christian? We don't care if you say Christmas. We <laughs> and then leading into the rest, um, yeah. you were talking about child abuse. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to child abuse, you were talking about the parents' action. But what the uh, a question that I had for you was, when do you think a parent should step in? Um, really, so much of the abuse happens in that larger system. The church is creating a shelter for abuse and the parents feeding into that system. And even if they were raised in it, they're still subjecting their children to the chance of being abused and then those abusers being moved off, shuffled off to Argentina, sent out to the Vatican, uh, uh, things like that. As I said, being a parent is very difficult to do and you're always working with uh, less information and I think it's your responsibility as a parent to find out what your kid is going through and be open with them as much as possible uh, and fight back things that are hurting your kids and other kids because we all care about each other and all kids. Um, and be careful what you teach your children too. Don't don't say uh, if you know an adult tells you to do something, do it because oh, that's hell the, no. that's the kind of a, a situation that you know. And, and it might be you might be talking about their teacher, for example. But you know you you need to be very careful about what you teach your kid to do because if they get this un don't question authority attitude, then that's the kind of situation that makes them vulnerable yeah. to, the, to the, that kind of abuse. All right, well, John, we made it. <laughs> we have survived an entire show without calls or uh, or an immediate internet except our phone. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, studio Thank you. audience. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, crew, for, Thank you. for uh, getting us to have a show today at all. You're, you do amazing work in there. We appreciate yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, all you folks on Twitter who contributed questions and, and helped us stagger through this thing. Uh, and we will see you next week, hopefully, with more internet. Okay. <laughs> Come join us at dinner if you're yep. in town. Star of India. See you there. Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.